Hi, everyone, and welcome to the second panel in the Film Music Media Symposium 2023 series. My name is Kai Savas, and I'm here speaking with renowned composer Matt Bowen. Uh, with a career in music for film and television spanning over a decade, Matt has left his musical mark on some of the most exciting projects in entertainment, including the Netflix original film The Binge, the holiday special It's a Wonderful Binge, and the Amazon hit series The Boys with composer Christopher Leonards. Uh, Matt, thank you so much for, for being here. It's so great to sit down one on one with you. I Thank you so much for having me. I, I'm a huge fan of film music media, so uh, oh, I'm happy. I'm, I'm very happy to be a part of it. And I'm a huge fan of your music, so this is so much, this is so exciting to get to sit down and and uh, talk shop with you for a bit. Well, so yeah, let's do so it. yeah, let's. Uh, so to kick off, I always love. I'm always interested in kind of people's origin stories. So I'm curious. Um, when did you do you remember kind of like a catalyst moment in your life where music became kind of whether it was childhood or later became an interest or a hobby before it became a career was there kind of a moment that kind of sparked it and what were you kind of gravitating towards to towards during that time yeah absolutely there's maybe a couple of ways to answer that so maybe i'll i'll go both without being too long-winded the the sure. first is um that i asked for my first violin when i was three. Oh wow um, and it, it was because my my mom and I were always going to the same uh, farmer's market where there was a street musician playing the violin. I always made her park it and we'd watch him. And, and I was like, that that's it. I, I got to do that. And I didn't come from a family of musicians necessarily. So it was kind of a shock for them to get that request. And I think they um, they followed through on it as my uh, Christmas present when I was three, just to kind of get it out of the way. And that was it. I mean, I, I was I was not joking around, um, and I've pl been playing violin ever since then. So, it, in one sense, uh, you know, music has been there and a part of me, and in an active form as long as I can remember. Right. Um, fast forward. I'll fast forward over quite a bit, um, and to the point of when I moved to LA which was not to be a composer, but it was to be a record producer. Oh, wow. Um, I had joined bands and I had become fascinated in the recording process. And um, I just loved everything about the behind the scenes aspect of, of record producing. I liked the collaboration. I liked this sense of like being an alchemist behind the curtains and, and you know, creating stuff and, and, then, and then releasing it. And little did I know that a lot of what I liked about record producing is, is what I would then... Uh, grow to love as a composer but um so i moved to la with that aspiration and and mind you for no good reason i didn't have really a solid lead um but i did start uh working as an engineer on some some major label albums um and and kind of in a way i accidentally started my jedi training of being a composer because you know, one of the biggest hurdles that a young composer can have is just the t the technical side. You can have great ideas, but if you can't get it out, you're, you're stuck. So it's almost like I came into composing in a re reverse order than most composers, where I, I, yeah. I had that I had that technical side down, where me and my DAW were, you know, I was on Pro Tools. We, you know, it was it was I was just we were one. Um, so by the time I started to pivot into composing, oh, let me answer your question, which is um, that one moment, which was I I did, um, I wanted to become a better music producer, which I thought would also mean let's become a better engineer. And so I took an internship at a music house uh, that did music for commercials. The reason I took the internship is they had an in-house studio and an in-house uh, engineer. And I thought I could just learn all these different you know, because they're working on a different genre literally every day. Yeah, um, yeah. And um, and I was right about that. And I did learn a lot from the in-house engineer. But that was when I first saw they had they had a couple of in-house composers, and that's when I first saw what composing really meant from start to finish. And that was just a just okay. I'm yeah. That that was that was kind of the moment when when I saw it as a profession that I wanted to work towards and uh what, were, what do you remember like the first steps you took because i mean that must have been like a, a shift for you i mean you had this entire 
buildup of your life to this point and then all of a sudden it's like wait no like scratch that let's pivot here like was it hard <laughs> to pivot or was it kind of an easy pivot yeah it's hard it's very hard to pivot i <laughs> i i yeah you don't just say oh, i'm going to be a composer and then you're a composer right, right. um so yeah there were there were many there were many um i was still working actively as an engineer for uh, I, I, I had hooked up with a record producer named Matt Wallace, um, who was who was doing kind of just album after album, and uh, and um, and so I was still. He would call me and say, "Yeah, I'm available," and then you know I'd disappear for a month while we went into the cave and made this you know album. Um, so that didn't stop. But on the side or in between those projects, I did start chipping away at. Well, for one, the music house started letting me demo for their commercials. Um, and it, I remember it was, and, and there was some, it was bad. I mean, I was, you know, <laughs> it was, they were clunkers and they were very gracious uh, in their feedback. I think, you know, it's, it's, it was as a favor for me having been an intern. Um, and I remember it was a really big deal. I went in and like, you know, went in to share with my wife. I was like, when the first day that they actually decided that what I had written was okay to show the client i didn't win the job <laughs> right it was just good enough to be like yeah we'll sh we'll put that in our presentation i was like yes um so so that was kind of i just started shipping away at it and then my first opportunities to work on music teams happened in kind of a a a rock or rock hybrid world um and so I was able to have some success out of the gates in in that sort of genre where um, that might be a genre that's, you know, uh, especially for a for a budding composer might be overwhelming. But obviously, yeah, I, yeah. I was very comfortable with with the production aspect of that. Um, and so that was and, and that's just blind luck. I mean, I didn't plan that. That was just the right. opportunity that showed up. Um and so that's how I, yeah, that's how the pivot started. And that's when I kind of started to get into it. And then those, those opportunities started to split off into more diverse um, tasks. And yeah. And and then there was, there was, I remember it like it was yesterday when, when that record producer called and said, I got a new job and I was able to say, I can't like, no, I, I have enough composing work. Wow. Um, I have enough composing work where I have to choose and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm choosing the composing work. So that's, but yeah, <laughs> and to, it, it, long, long story short, it was, it was a, it, the, the pivot was gradual. It wasn't a, yeah, yeah, it wasn't yeah. a hard right turn. Mentally, that's... it was a hard right turn. <laughs> Practically, it was very gradual. That's a, that's an awesome story. I mean, I love how everyone, yeah, everyone's story is so unique. I've never, I, I ask that question a lot and never get the same answer. It's always, no, never always. get the same answer. I know. I, for a while, I'll be like, I wanted to say, oh, my answer is different. And I was like, yeah, everyone's answer is different. It's... Yeah. I think uh, when I talked to Austin, Austin Winter, he, he described it best, the best. It's like you're literally just kind of chipping away at like a, a wall and you finally make a crack. But the second you fill the, get through the crack of the wall, it just seals back up. So you keep, no one can follow like the same path. It's just like you have to totally. find your own path somehow. But it's Yeah, I love that image. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's uh let's dive into I want to talk about one of your latest projects, uh the the holiday comedy It's a Wonderful Binge, which is available on Hulu and uh has such a wonderful score. Uh this past month, uh thank you took us behind the scenes on Film Music Media uh with your awesome director taking us to, to Nate's studio uh for the bar Fox Wurlitzer Organ and how you utilize that for the score. I've been there, I did a tour with Nate and walked around. He showed me when he was installing it. That's a amazing cool the coolest thing in the world that he has there that he rescued from 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 fox but uh it's so inspiring it's so cool so uh uh i'll definitely put the the video uh for the behind the scenes uh in the link uh down down below from the video so if you guys want to check it out go check out the behind the scenes on that but um tell us about your experience of working uh, and creating music with the world sir and for anybody who doesn't know what a world sir is what is that fox world sir organ and and what are you doing with it? <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Yeah, well, I answer the easier one first, which is what what is it? And it's yeah, a, it's a pipe organ, but it's not just a pipe organ. It's also uh, I think it's referred to as a theater organ, and that's yeah. because it can do everything, um, like everything, everything, like 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 sounds and stuff. 
um, because they came from the 1920s ish or earlier when they were doing silent movies. And if you needed a car, you needed a police siren, you needed to be able to press a button. Um, but obviously I, I wasn't interested in that stuff, but I was interested in all the things that set it apart from just being a pipe organ. Um, I was very interested in the pipe organ part because it was so big and powerful and, and iconic. Yeah. But it also had a whole mallet chamber and, and Nate did give me a tour as well, which just started the process and also made me realize I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, <laughs> But that's also it's a fun that's a fun feeling it's a terrifying feeling um and they have a whole percussion chamber where you know, it's got marimba xylophone celeste um very christmasy and yeah. uh they even have pitched sleigh bells <laughs> when i heard that i just was like giggling I'm like this is gonna be too easy it's never too easy but um <laughs> um so it's just incredibly versatile is uh, versatile is such an understatement of of the the instrument yeah. Um, so I, I didn't know how to implement it is really the first part of the answer. Well, where, did the, where did the idea come from? When, when, when was it like, oh, let me call oh, it. Oh yeah. It's an that. important part yeah, of that <laughs> part process. Um, yeah, that part, um, if you do watch the video mentioned, um, we touch on it there, but Jordan and I, Jordan, uh, Vendina is the writer and director on the movie and you know exploratory brainstorming process you know this is an r-rated raunchy comedy but it's holiday what if the score was just ignored all of the comedy and all ignored all the raunchy and what if this was you know if you if you heard only the score would it be to you know home alone five or six you know one of those home alones you know maybe that has never been made yet but that's right this is the score for it um and and we just loved that idea. And then I had just recently seen one of the videos that Nate had posted um, where he was listing off kind of all the iconic scores that, that you know, sounded music and whatever that, that, this, that this thing had been a part of. And uh, he said one of the last scores it was a part of was was Home Alone. And so I mentioned that to Jordan as a joke and as thing you know, as things go, you know, it's like, oh, that's funny. Yeah. No, no, actually, that would be amazing. What if we used the, <laughs> that organ um, for our super earnest, wholesome score? Um, and and so I, I I called up Nate and and you know it it did it worked out. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that that was kind of and I do like to you know any any new project I do like to start off with some element of unfamiliarity. Um, it just keeps you fresh. It keeps you, you know, you want to keep reinventing, I don't know, reinventing yourself, but. But like, I mean, you're, you're, you're chasing, you know, you, you want to stimulate yourself creati creatively as well. So, right. And every project is, you know, and, and you're going with a, a director who wants to do something original and unique. And I'm sure as a composer, you definitely want to evolve, not, I guess, yeah, evolve or evolve your sound, but also just add to your, to your repertoire and you just add to your, uh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And also, yeah, you, you get, you, you learn how to make some things sound good in certain ways and that right. can become a crutch. Um, and, and you don't, I, you don't want, you know, it's like they, they want something fresh. They, they hired me for something fresh that's unique to this movie. So, um, I like, you know, whether it's buying a new instrument or, 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 thinking you know about a different way of handling the the harmonic language or of that particular project or whatever so in, in this case it was a gigantic one because it was this instrument that um to write off the bat i had i had plenty of unfamiliarity to deal with um and so uh, as i mentioned nate did give me a, a quick tour and they happened to have one of their go-to session musicians there at the time yeah and he gave me a quick tour uh, while playing stuff um, but even then, I did book an exploratory session. I just needed to because there's there's what can the what do we know the organ can do? And even then, I wanted to see. I was like, yeah, but how how can I use it maybe right. differently than it's ever been used? Um, and his his uh, one of the in house uh, engineers, Harry Rosilio just dove in the deep end with me and it was awesome he you know he he had miked the the percussion chamber which as i mentioned is that's that's like all your 
uh, mallets. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm after the Chilest and pitched um, pitched sleigh bells in particular. He miked it. He once I started telling him what I was calling going after, and I wanted it more intimate. He miked it in a way that he had never miked it before, just for this project. And he's like, "I'm going to oh, try wow. something like that's great. This is what we're here to do: is try stuff. This is you know exploratory session." So he did it. Who knew if it, it, now? Granted, he had plenty of other. He had he had the room mics that he would always use anyway. He had the setup, right. so it's not like we were uh, we had no fail safes here. Um, but he was a part of the you know creative process. Everyone was everyone's part of you know. I love it when when all the any and all team members. Um, I I don't. It's not like I hired you to fit inside this tiny little box. It's like yeah, bring yeah. your bring your creativity. So um, that exploratory session went great, and in doing so, we were able to keep a lot of material for I would say a quarter of the score. Um, so that, and then I and then I came and because we were just tracking to sketches, um, some of which Jordan had heard, some of which he hadn't, and so not everything we tracked you know got used but you know even finding out that something doesn't work is informative yeah yeah so um the, we had the exploratory session and then wrote the remainder of the score and then had a much more traditional like <laughs> okay we're gonna have sheet music prepared uh we have all these cues where the the sketches are approved and we're just gonna go in and bang them out um sort yeah. of thing so we did have oh. it and then we had that follow-up session that's amazing. So t talk to me about where did you get the inspiration for, uh, we talked about now kind of like the, the you know tech, the technical side of how you approach the score using the Wurlitzer, um, but where did you get, let's talk about more just the score itself. So where did you get the inspiration for the main theme of, of It's a Wonderful Binge? What was kind of the, the source of that first idea to kind of spark to, what did you pull from to create that theme, I guess? Yeah, I love that question. And that kind of stems also from that brainstorming talk with Jordan where we yeah. we established what world we wanted to live in and it was earnest and it was classic and you know you look at, at definitely uh, Elf is a huge source of inspiration here that's just oh, I just love that score so deeply oh, God. Yeah, um, and, and, so I, and I'm a terrible singer so I won't do it but I could right now sing you that the main you know I'll whistle it like bam that's the main theme and it's beautiful and it's sweeping and it can be comedic and whatever and like oh uh, and not that that's you know i reduced the score to that that but you know home alone similarly they've, they've got this big sweeping theme and it's right in your face it's not a yeah. texture it's not tucked in um and you and it's not that's kind of like the classic more more classic way of scoring and you don't always see that in scores these days um, but I, Not at all, I yeah. really wanted, to, I really wanted to do that, and I kind of had never done it so prominently. Um, so I was really looking forward to that experience too. And I, I voiced that all to Jordan, and he was in. So it was just a matter of what is that theme, and it was just a lot of um, tinkering around. A lot of, you know, I, uh, I'm kind of weird about when it's time to like actually come up with the seed of something. I, I don't like using my very expensive very manicured setup here there's something about the finality of it that is um a, a hurdle that's hard for me to get over um really if i'm if i'm just making a voice memo there's no way that voice memo can end up in the score and so there's a freedom to that uh. um or if i'm playing on the piano in our house um, there's a freedom to that because i'm not it's not hooked up to anything right um, and so there was this, you know, in the afternoons or evenings, I was just there was this idea that I thought I like, and I just kind of every night I'd just sit down for five minutes and I'd just start playing it, and then it started to become this thing where, um, my my younger daughter would like, oh, she whenever she'd hear that she'd come out and it's you know it's it's kind of a rolling triplet do, 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 sort of, um, and she'd come out and she'd start dancing to it and like okay well that's kind of a good sign like if we want if we want like pure and earnest um and um so i i would just kind of every every night i would, would come out and you know go in there and, and I would just start playing it and she would come out and dance and i would just kind of let it let that marble roll around until i was confident to share it with with jordan and i said this, wow. is, this is the theme and i'm going to use it and abuse it so you have to tell me if you don't absolutely love it <laughs> because you're gonna hear a lot of it um 
and he left. <laughs> So I, I do want to also mention that I guess the film was originally set to be ready for uh, Christmas 2021, mm-hmm. and but there were challenges the crew had to overcome. Uh, how did production timing uh, affect your scoring process throughout that whole film? Yeah, it started with a, oh my gosh, we're greenlit, and not only greenlit, but we got to go. Yeah. And um, I kind of already alluded to, you know, some of the mental hurdles you have to get over creatively and and sometimes having too much time is another yeah, hurdle. Yeah. Um, and so that just, you know, you might bemoan a deadline, but that deadline means sometimes you have to, you have to create whether you like it or not. And that can be a blessing. And yeah. so I had that and it was go. And so I immediately started in on, um, I know I, t- I just talked about how this marble was rolling around the back of my head. Well, that's because I, I came up with this theme immediately. Um, and I think I, I thought I liked it, but I was like, you know, it's kind of, it's kind of nerve wracking to be like, this is how I'm going to base the rest of the score. Um, yeah. And it, and it, so creatively it was a sprint out of the gates. And then I don't know how much time passed, maybe <laughs> It was just weeks, probably, when they think yeah. they realized. My, uh, I don't get to it. My guess is it came down to actor availability. Um, uh, but when they said, "Okay, we're we're paused, we're still greenlit, but we're paused," and because it's a holiday movie, <laughs> you can't push back six months. You have to push back a year. Um, yeah. And so it's almost like this is how every project should go because it was awesome. Because it was like <laughs> a, you have to create right now okay, now you have to sit on that idea for six months and decide whether or not you like it. (laughs) Um, So that, that was the, um, I, I actually am quite grateful for how the, the schedule turned out. Um, Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, more time is always, yeah, you know, the deadlines do help, but I I just interviewed uh, Sun Lux about everything everywhere. And they talked about how they said they probably didn't think they'll be able to, to do what they did the pandemic didn't come in and they shut down they had all that time to deal with that score that score was just a beast that they had to put together I, but i cannot imagine <laughs> putting that score together i think a beast beast is the great way i mean amazing and beautiful of course too but yeah. beast is i mean it's so, a, yeah it, 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 it's a yeah, that's incredible yeah so you got you got that extra time were there any uh were you able to during that time were you able to incorporate any fun easter eggs into the to the film or the score <laughs> um i'm trying to think um i mean we always think we're being so crafty but it's usually just to spark our own creativity yeah um you know outside of the oh there well there was a um there was a moment where the the this this is this is the business um there was a moment (laughs) where jordan said i want this to be an ave maria moment because we were what we were doing was a, a um, it was a very tight parallel to It's a Wonderful Life. Uh, so there was the bridge moment where, you know, you c- kind of your fl- your life flashes before your eyes. Yeah. And it's very introspective. It's very epic. It's very spiritual, um, which is where the Ave Maria um, idea came from. And that was Jordan's idea. Um, uh, and then I thought, well, okay, I, I definitely want to tie this into our score. But I, I, um, but so I'll I'll write my own operatic piece and I brought in an opera singer. Um, and I had just mocked it up with fake opera, which is just oohs and ahs. Um, and she was singing it and it was, it was, I thought it was sounding great, but she mentioned again, this is the beauty of collaborating with talented people. She mentioned, you know, I could really dig into this a lot better if there were consonants. And I, and I thought, I was like, you know, I really don't want to write lyrics in this moment. Like, I don't want that. I don't want to take anybody out of the scene. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, we're mid session. So clock's ticking. Um, so I had this idea to like, well, what if, what if we just, you know, inspired by Ave Maria, what if we just did something in Latin? And so bring up Google Translate and right there on the spot, I just typed in, you know, because we're heavily referencing It's a Wonderful Life. The movie is called It's a Wonderful Binge. Uh, type in it's a wonderful life um and uh up pops sue 
Suavita Mirabilis. Uh, I'm probably hacking that up, but it doesn't really matter because <laughs> what they were were beautiful consonants for her to sing. And so, um, so there, and and there in that scene, you know, as as he's um, having this blood, you know, this internal crisis, um, she's just just beautifully singing Suavita Mirabilis. I'm not going to try to sing it, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so that was kind of fun. If if anybody, that's that's a bit of a stretch of an Easter egg. But if anybody knows their Latin, um, they'll be like, "Hey, they just said it's a wonderful life." Um, <laughs> might be a stretch, but but no, it's a good. That's that's one that's that's just usually for you to keep. <laughs> that's you yeah. know, yeah, yeah. And most like ninety nine point nine percent probably won't catch it. But <laughs> right, yes. <laughs> I'll, I would be thrilled to hear that one person caught it. Yeah, that one person. Come on, <laughs> let us know. Comment below if you caught it. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, I want to now jump into talk to you about your work with uh, Chris Leonard, who uh, mutual friend of ours, amazing, amazing guy, amazing composer. Um, you two have collaborated on a number of projects like The Boys, The Boys Presents Diabolical, and the new spinoff in The Boys Universe Gen uh, Gen V, which you're working on right now. Um, so how did? But let's go back to the beginning. How did your relationship with uh, Christopher come to be? And what is the working dynamic between the two of you? Uh, yeah, two two parter, very different. Um, I mean, how it came to be was uh, I was just bl another blind luck part of my career development, put in touch with him for a job. I should know this off the top of my head. I want to say <laughs> fifteen years ago. Um, it was a while ago. Yeah, it's um, a while. And he, you know, he just needed he needed some help he knew he was looking he was assembling a music team as we do yeah um and at, at the time I, I i really had no business writing for his um working on his music team but but i i slugged it out enough so that you know i i kind of became a consistent member of his teams and that role took a ton of different forms i mean sometimes i was just uh, an arranger sometimes i would do a little additional music sometimes it you know it was anything and everything in between it's you know your team members how how can i help and, and yeah and it's usually very project dependent um so that's how the relationship started and he's really one of my main main mentors um so you know our relationship is very much uh mentor mentee um but yeah in, in recent years it's it's become you know a little you know at times a little more collaboration and then at times more collaboration and then um um yeah so we, we have started our, i think our, our first time co-scoring was a netflix series called best worst weekend ever oh um, yeah, yeah, yeah so that was that was maybe i'm just gonna throw out four ish four to five years ago um and so that, that was our first time you know working together and it's really funny to co-score with somebody who's been such a tremendous mentor because uh, right. I'll be like, yeah, do you feel like, like, like I'll, I'll, I'll write, write something. to speak up more? <laughs> yeah. Or I'll like, I'll write something and be like, Hey man, uh, this is posted. Do you want to check it out? And he's like, this is your show too. I'm like, right, oh, right, 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 right. Okay. Um, trust myself. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> so, um, so that, you know, that took some, uh, I had to unlearn that a little bit. Um, and then, and then just how, you know, you asked our, our working dynamic is, um, I, just very practically, I think, um, our music production sensibilities specifically are very similar. Um, mm -hmm. and there's something about that being similar that allows us to get on the pa same page really quickly there, you know, there's a lot of shorthand, um, creatively where it's, it, it's all very quick and easy. You know, I, I, I would say we're pretty different writers, um, which is awesome. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we can compliment each other. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Um, but having this, having similar production sensibilities allows, you know, if we're coming from different places writing wise, but similar productions that, you know, it, it'll still sound homogenous or uh, right. you know, at least connected enough. I don't want to say, you know, the, uh, I don't want to give any boring undertones, but um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, uh, I think it's, uh, and even, you know, right now it's, we're working on something together and it's just very, uh, our, our, 
if if we were to you know YouTube our creative calls, it, they they would almost they might be uninspiring because it's just very quick. It's like this this yep this yep cool. What if we what if we cool n done yeah. and then and then get to work. Um, so yeah, that's awesome. I mean that that shorthand allows you yeah, to get to the creative stuff and and it's that's I think why the part a good uh, collaborative relationship works that way is that you know that shorthand where you don't have to communicate and in on in and discuss and rehash <laughs> things you know <laughs> yeah yeah and because because the reality is at the end of the day there's a lot of work to be done so if you're yeah. if you're spending so much time just yammering you're you're not getting work done um right <laughs> so yeah no it, it's it is it's I don't take for granted that we get on the same page quickly it's it's really nice well, let's uh, talk. Let's use that as when. So, when you started working on the boys, um, mm -hmm. how quickly were you to able to agree on what the I guess the tone of the show was, and how did you come to what the tone of the music was going to be for the show? And given what the show is, given how character heavy it is, and how you know it really is trying to tell. I mean, it's great storytelling. It's not just something it's pop poppy and pulpy and actiony. It's really trying to do something substantial. And so, where did you want to go with the tone with the score, and how did you and Chris, I guess? come to an agreement you know to what the score was going to be yeah well there's two ways to answer that and one is um talking more specifically about season three because that's when the collaboration really it started to be right, a little more right, collaboration right. if i'm answering from a season one standpoint you know th this has been chris's show from day one and i right. was just l lucky enough to be invited onto the team um, so that the, the answer to season one is probably a less in interesting than you might have hoped in that it's, it's Chris leading the charge and, yeah. and us following his lead. Um, that said, I was very thrilled to be, uh, I was, I was there when the sound of the show was being made. Um, you know, a lot of times when you're on the music team, you're brought on after that, um, and just from a learning standpoint, that's such a pivotal part of a score. I mean, you, yeah, you know, if if you've worked as additional music, you it's very easy to take for granted how many densely creative decisions have been made before you're even brought on the project. What is the world you're going to live in? So, Chris was, you know. Chris led the charge on that, but I was I, I was actually around for that process and a part of the brainstorming and and got to see it. And I think that was uh, it was the first time I'd really been a part of that part of the process on such a big project. And so when it came time for he and I to do that on the next time we work together, I'm going to start going vague because we're in the middle of yeah on it. but uh, <laughs> i had i had seen that process and was a part of it but with chris you know chris uh leading the charge creatively um mm -hmm. and so i kind of knew what what needed to be done just you know how do you do it is the question um so yeah um but yeah this this has been this has been you know following chris's lead all the way up through uh into season three and then it was season three when it started to kind of cross over into a little bit more of a collaborative role. Right. And there was uh, a new, th you know, for the most part, you get to season three a a and y you have a lot of creative work to do, but a lot of your creative decisions have been made based on what you've done the first two seasons. But season three did need, I guess we're far enough, we're plenty far enough removed from the show to say there was a new element, um, new component that's unique to season three called V24. And it, needed its own theme or its own sound. Um, and so because I was transitioning into a, you know, a somewhat more collaborative role that Chris did, you know, he said, I want to, I want to bang this idea around with you. And so that was pretty cool to, to bring that new idea to life. And, yeah, you know, how do we, how do we work within the world that's been established, but give it give this you know give it a new sound that's specific to this one element um and it was a lot of fun and i also think that you know the solution we came up with has worked very well yeah absolutely and you uh you and chris also co-scored uh two episodes of the boys presents diabolical which is the animated spinoff um one specifically being the one plus one equals two episode um what was your scoring process like for that episode um, yeah, that was, 
uh, that was a lot of yeah again so as you said we we co-scored those so that was um very fun to be transitioned into a you know a collaborative partnership on those and for that episode specifically um you know it's an eight episode series we worked on two of them and they they exist in the world of the boys but they're these random one one-off things right. except for this particular episode is is canon yeah um and it was real so it was really cool to to work and i guess kind of necessary for us to work on it because um it was a, a prequel of i mean not of sorts it was a prequel it was a, it was a um it's the word i'm looking for it was a uh origin story there we go yeah um so we needed to think okay this came before all the music that was written in season one one okay so back up and then and so um for the most part we ignored that this was a boys thing but then there is the moment um that's the one of the main characters named homelander um it's really where it's that point where homelander becomes the homelander as we know him on the show which is mm -hmm. diabolical um and so we treat the score one way up to that moment and then from that point on i'm gonna say it's about halfway maybe closer to two-thirds of the way from that point on we we do score it a little more like a boy's um a, a, a boy's show and right. at the very end um I'm going to spoil the very end if they haven't seen it, but anyone hasn't seen it. But... Well, spoiler, spoiler alert. We're saying spoiler alert. There we go. Listening right there, now, oh, like, yeah. Great. There we go. Spoiler alert. Yeah. We're going to spoiler territory. Yes. So, <laughs> so th there's kind of two pivotal moments. There's the one where Homelander becomes the Homelander that we know as we know it. And then there's another one where he makes another pivot and realizes he can manipulate the media to to work in his favor. And that's really where we drop the main theme um for for him and for Vought that's from the main show um but we just did it, it but we were like okay this is a prequel so it can't be like this big grandiose thing so it was it was you know you kind of not to compare us to you know john williams but you think about like the star wars it's just like you know you just right. have that solo french horn version of the of the luke theme or whatever yes, like yes. let's have us just a, just a gentle little so we had this very nice little solo french horn version of of the main theme because that you know that made sense that like here if you were to watch it in order you would hear that gentle little oh there's the french horn theme and then you turn on season one of the boys and then there's you know the bigger orchestral version of it yeah absolutely. So and, that and, was pretty cool and, i mean and did uh the fact that it was animated change the way you approached the writing at all or was it you treat it just i mean you talked about how you you kind of treated it as a boys episode you got to a certain point was it did you change the style or maybe the approach at all because it was animation or did that have no play in, in, and no effect in, in it? it it did and it didn't yeah I, I once we made the turn it was pretty boys um before the turn we were very much drawing inspiration from from the animation and then along those lines we did, did we did do another episode called Lenny pusher that um was centered around butcher uh, which you know, be one of the other main characters in in the main show. When I say the main show, I mean you know, the boys. Right. Um, um, but his character was his depiction was as it was in the comic books. It had nothing to do. It was not inspired by you know the character that Carl Urban plays in the boys. So in that sense, we were we were totally, you know, it needed to feel like it was kind of boys adjacent but right, right. um so in that in that case we were very much inspired by the animation oh wow so you definitely have a, you know, have a range of genres that you work with musically and i think tying it back to it's a wonderful binge how you talked about how you're going for that kind of homey kind of christmasy you know heartfelt john williams type elf type stuff um for a stoner comedy but you know doing that juxtaposition of this you know score working with whatever the film is but i'm curious what your approach to scoring kind of you know projects across different genres is do you does the genre have any influence on the way you write the instrumentation you use the orchestration you do or is genre just too much of a boxing into like putting you in a corner type thing that you just try not to 
think about? <laughs> That's um, a phenomenal question. And the short answer is yes to everything you just said. I mean, it's, <laughs> yeah. it, it all it all matters. Yeah. Um, you know, if it's documentary, you're, you're working with broader brushstrokes. If you're animation, you're turning tighter corners and, you know, scripted drama somewhere in between. Um, but when it comes to palette, um, palette, I feel like doesn't, doesn't matter so much which, you know, which medium or, or genre of, of, you know, picture you're working in. Yeah. Um, so, and, and that is, as I already, you know, alluded to with regards to, you know, getting to see the boys come to life. It's like, oh, establishing the palette is such a pivotal, mm. forget what your theme is. What is the world you're going to live in? You know, yeah. what do you want the viewer to feel? Um, and that just changes project to project, whether whether it's documentary or animated or scripted or or whatever. So I I have I would say I've been fortunate enough to work in a lot of music genres yeah. um, and that's just i'd say fortunate for a number of reasons one is there's you know exposure and and when you learn something over here it informs you even when you're working way over here um and also just just to keep uh at, at the end of the day you want to keep coming up with fresh ideas Right, And I would be really concerned if I were working in the exact same genre project to project that, you know, I would like to think I'd keep coming up with fresh ideas, but it's, it's a lot easier if you're, if you're genre hopping. Yeah. I mean, but is, it, does it, I, I'm sure it happens similar to an actor being pigeonholed into a certain genre. I'm sure composers, I mean, I know they do. I've talked to composers who are like, I'm stuck in oh, this yeah. family friendly stretch that I want to get out of, or I'm stuck in this horror stretch I want to get out of. Like, do you make it kind of in your career now at this point, do you consciously try to do that genre hop so that you can keep it fresh? And if you have that, you know, opportunity and that, you know, you're lucky to be able to have those choices. <laughs> I, I would love to say that it was a um, creative and decision to fill my soul and all that <laughs> stuff, but no, it, it's just another blind luck. It's just right. the, the way that stuff has, has popped up. Um, and um, I remember um, hearing Teddy Shapiro talk about his career path and I loved how he put it in that um, um you know, a lot of people use the road analogy. You're in a car, yeah. you're driving, and and you can and you can make a turn. He said, you know, you're, you know, when you're a composer and probably a lot of creative careers, you're not on a road, you're on a river. And if you're lucky enough, you're on a moving river, i.e., you're you're working and paying the bills and all that stuff. But that river is just going. Yeah. Um, and every now and then, there might be a fork in the river. And if you work if you see that coming and you work really hard, you might be able to get over there and kind of change that path. And I just thought that was such a good image for, it's like, yeah, no, that's, that's, I'm, I'm just, I'm taking the river wherever it's taking me. Right. Um, and should an opportunity show up over there that I'm interested in, in, in a career pivot sort of way, maybe, maybe I could go for it. So. No, that's what, yeah. No, oh, Teddy's fantastic. And I think that's, he, that's such a wonderfully put too. I mean, what he did with severance, you know, it's just like oh, mind forget blowing. <laughs> like, forget it. Oh, that's, a, you, that's, that's a score yeah. that makes you want to quit. I know. <laughs> but then it's interesting because yeah, he talked, I mean, he, a lot of his career with Ben Stiller is through comedies because Ben was doing comedies at the time. And then all of a sudden he's directing this, you know, tense mystery, you know, drama. And it's like, all of a sudden you have a new world to play in kind of, you know? Totally. Well, I think that's how that question came up because he, he was yeah. very deep in the comedy world. Um, and they said, did you make a concerted effort? And he, and he used that, that imagery and it just really right. stuck with me. Um, but you know, step one is getting on a moving river, um, which is, you know, fortunate enough to have happened already. So. Yeah. And just writing it down. So as we yeah. kind of wind down the, the conversation, is there anything we mentioned, um, uh, Gen V, is there anything else that you can talk about that's coming up that you're allowed to talk about any projects? I don't think there is. <laughs> um, 
No worries. I mean, I'm not yeah. sure what my <laughs> yes, Chris and exactly. I are collaborating yes. on a score and uh, having a fantastic time doing it, and I can't wait for you to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly said. <laughs> Welcome to Hollywood, baby. <laughs> yes. And uh, to 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 close us off, I, I, we have always a lot of young aspiring composers who are uh, um, trying to break into the industry, get their foot in the door, getting started on this career path. And I know we started talking about how everyone's origin story is going to be different, but I'm curious, is there any advice that you would give to younger people coming, especially at this point where the mm -hmm. industry is changing and the ground is shifting underneath us almost every day? Is there anything that you've kind of gained from your experience in your career so far that you would maybe pass on to somebody just entering right now? Yeah. Um, it is shifting quite a bit. I mean, I, I have two ways to answer this because one's very practical and one's kind of a little more artistic. Mm -hmm. The practical side is just to say yes as much as possible, as much as time allows, as much as yeah. your your bank account allows. I know that's a it, it can be, you know, it's like easier said than done, but saying yes is just it gets you involved, it gets you experience. You know, everyone says like, oh, you know, make contacts or whatever. Like you, you there's no there's working with people. These are right. collaborations and there's no better way to make contacts than to be in the trenches with somebody and to have a positive experience both ways. Um, so and that's not gonna happen unless you're working on anything. Um right. so just start saying yes, um it is kind of you'll be surprised at you know, opportunities start showing up as the more you say yes. So that's kind of the more practical side. The more artistic side is that I see a lot of it is the, the, you know, um, maybe watching a YouTube video and then thinking, great, I know how to do that. It's like, no, <laughs> yeah, don't. You watched it and you understood it and you think you could implement it, but now you need to go implement it and you need to go implement it a hundred times. Yes. Um, and this is a very long winded way of saying, don't forget to write. Um, a lot of times when you're starting out, you're, there are roles where you're not writing and that's just the nature of our business. Um, you're finding out ways to help and it's not always with, it's rarely with writing actually yeah. when you're starting out. Um, but whenever possible, if, if you can find a reason to do it, a project to do it, if not do it for yourself, just keep writing. Cause I, I think there's a huge that Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours element to, you yep. know, you gotta, you gotta get your clunkers out bef before somebody who matters yeah. uh, is hearing it. Um, so right, right, right. No, those are all great things. I would, I, only thing I would add is that patience. I think patience, is another thing, like for like, I've been kind of cu coming up with this topic a lot, some other people where it's like, I talked to Shonda Dancy. We talk, I talked to Greg Nicolette. And we we're just talking about like, yeah, we kind of, you come out of college and you're like, all right, I'm ready to be a composer. I'm ready to be a filmmaker. And it's like, nope. It's going to take some time and just be patient. You're going to see your friends buy houses and have kids and they're, you know, they're in business and finance and that's all well. But if you're picking this career that you're passionate about, it might take a little longer to kickstart, but I promise that if you work hard and keep at it, it, it will kick in. <laughs> yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's probably the first answer actually is patience. It's a <laughs> yeah. Patience is very important. Yeah. You got to have the drive, but, um, uh, but Matt, thank you so much for for sitting down this evening and, and chatting and, and and joining us for this amazing conversation. Oh, I'm so, loved it. I'm so glad to have you as a guest, and thank you to our friends at uh, Impact Twenty Four for helping Film Music Media put uh, this panel together and part of the uh, symposium series. And we have more panels uh, in the series, so be sure to fill, visit uh, filmmusicmedia.com to to check them out. So again, right Matt, on. thank thanks, you so. Man. Thanks for having me, Kai. It was great chatting.